Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, now it's uh, 15 past five. I guess people are tired. So I want to ask the questions before I go on. Do parents with young children of Hong Kong have sufficient support? So I want a show of hands. Do you think the question, the answer of the question is negative? Please raise your hand. Okay. Seems it's that the majority. Okay, I, I, I just, uh, I think I don't repeat a lot because I think many speakers talk about the government's attitude that families show the all the responsibility. I just want a little bit uh, about uh, what's the current support to uh, childcare centers in Hong Kong when it was the support to the parents. At present, um, the government only provide five to seven percent subsidy to the parents to use the service, unless you are poor families. And to the center, just the center for zero to two, the day crash, they provide another two percent on administrative support, that's it. So you see how minimal is the government support, so we call it a remedial model. Uh, on the other hand, government do a lot compared with the formal childcare, it's occasional childcare. There's rapid expansion on occasional childcare. Um, because, see there below. Oh, sorry. Okay. The reason is because the government. Eh? I lost it. Okay. Because the government think that it's just. Uh, they just. The childcare is just to support occasional care for different reasons, for work or for maybe you need to run some emergency and something like that. Oh, didn't get. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So my topic is about parental stress. So what kind of stress parents have? I would say two sources of stress. First of all, having a child is a big thing, right? And there's a lot of stress associated with childbirth itself. The second is Taking care of a young children is a lot of daily hassles. It's not a big thing, but it's a lot of little things in the daily routine that parents feel very tired, a lot of stress. So let's see the first of all. Um, by two psychiatrists, uh, Thomas Holmes and also Richard Ratchel, in 1967, they developed a scale called major life stresses. There are 41 of them. Okay, 41 of the whole life. After a childbirth, you see that those are highlighted in blue. It's very easy, you get that. Of course, um, very often, uh, people and couples start to have different opinions about how to raise a child, right? It's normal because you come from different family background. Then, many families think about, hmm, I need to buy a new house, a major mortgage stress comes. What about your living condition? You have to change to accommodate the baby's needs. Change your sleeping habit, of course. Every two hours, you need to uh, feed your baby. And then change your eating habit, you know? Now you don't have much time to cook your own food. Grab something convenient. So you can see that add together is 175 scores. And that, if you have, is, is in the mid-range already. It's moderate stress, okay? What about this? Many young couples, they're at the life stage, they have other changes. Some like to cohabit, and then they have a child. They do two things together, right? They start to commit in marriage. Some couple, maybe one of them, one of the parents, will get a promotion, you know? In the 30s, it's normal. Or one of the parents may think about quit quitting job. So another stress for family. So easily, the stress come to 259. That is uh, quite high. So another source of stress is daily stresses. This is a scale called Parenting Daily Hassles uh, for parents of young children. The parent would check and see whether you are low, medium, or high stress in daily hassles. Some findings here. Parental stress really affects young children's development. 
uh, parents, if they regularly report their greatest stress, they found that they, would, they tend to be more authoritarian in their parenting style. I won't blame the parent because it's so stressful. And the parent-child interaction tend to be more negative. And also, they are less involved. A few researchers have confirmed this point. The second point is, the parent, if there's high parenting stress, it's also associated with a range of negative outcomes for the child, such as they feel insecure, and some start to have behavioral problems. In other research, we found that 13% of the parents, they tend to re repeat, have high daily, feel that daily hassles is stressful for them. If they have a two-year measurement for age three to five. So they regularly do the, rec the, the measurement. They found that if five, uh, four out of five, they reported stressful, about 30% of parents would have that phenomenon. What about the life stresses? Um, in these two years, age three to five, two out of three measurement, some parents also rep re report that they're high life stresses. So two stresses can add together, become cumulative stress. And then it will contribute to parents' less positive affect. You know, when parents don't feel happy, you won't have positive parent-child interaction, right? If you feel nervous, you feel angry, you cannot smile naturally to your child. So you can see that if a parent without good support and always feel stressful, it would affect the child outcome too. So who can support our parents? There are two kinds of support. First of all, it's informal care. Easy. Grandparents is a big source of support. In Hong Kong, we also have, um, I think it's getting less. In, 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 when I was young, I think we get more this kind of paid caregivers, the care of children in, in small groups in their own home or some mutual help child care center. We, do, we still have it by volunteer care. And now we have a, a bigger portion is the neighborhood support child care project, also by volunteer care. Formal care, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Hong has reported, so I don't repeat, uh, is just two kinds. Uh, but I, I want to report a little bit about the private child care center. Actually, my staff team really tried to search. Okay, according to social welfare, uh, social welfare department website, there are some registered private childcare centers. We call them, see what kind of childcare they offer. And we found that most of them, they offer playgroups. I think uh, just one or two offer really full day or half day care, but they charge a very high fee, 8000 a month. So it's not easily affordable and the capacity is also very low. So informal childcare in Hong Kong is a big portion of childcare in Hong Kong because the formal childcare under three is very minimal. So are they adequate to help different types of families? Okay, I skipped this because I've talked a lot about this already. Okay. Let's see our parents. Uh, for parents with children aged three to six, you can see that 45% are dual earner. So it means two income job. Now, Hong Kong is famous for what? For long working hours, right? <laughs> so if both parents work very long hours, and then you have one or two kids who's demanding your care and attention, what can you do? So you can see that the deal earning, the deal earners, uh, is a big group, and then another 36 percent, they're single parent. So you can see that there are lots of needs in these families. Okay, so also skip this. Okay, see other profile. Um, we can see that actually. Families of young children compared to other families uh, with the same number of persons in the household, they, are, they have a lower income. 
of the reason maybe some of them may work part time, or they don't have that many choices for job, right? You will compromise a bit in, in the choice of your job. So you can see that there's a consistent pattern that parents of young children earn uh, lower than the household with medium income. And also, we have to remember, it's also a group of families, they are receiving CSSA, the government support. A lot of these families have, a, have some reasons for them to receive CSSA, right? Maybe have one parent, they have medical illness, chronic illness, one parent may have psychiatric illness, or different reasons, or new immigrants, they cannot find a job. So they have a reason, so they can be eligible for CSSA. So are these parents, we just see the income level, I'll remind you, these parents are not encouraged to use childcare, right? Because you can take care of your child. So, but are these parents that need adjust childcare? Would they need parent education? A, 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 person, a professional to talk to them how to be the, an effective parent, but they're not encouraged to do that with the current provision. Also the age of first time mother. You can see that many of this, the first time mother, they are, they are in their age range of 25 to 30 something. They're at a period that they're also busy at work. Imagine, probably they have worked for five, seven years, and then they start to be more dependent by the superior, okay? There's their experience stuff already, so they have heavier workload. And also, we can see that there's also a trend that the average age of the first-time mother goes up. Part of the reason may be because of the childcare, you know, they worry about that. Or they still have to figure out, should I jump into that pool, right? It's a, a lot of heading. How about the education? Uh, we can see that among the parents who have children aged three to six, 26% have um, a higher degree, I mean a degree, a tertiary education. Uh, but you can see that the majority may have an average uh, secondary school uh, uh, qualification. But we still have 13.9%. They only have just the primary education. So do they need extra help? That's my question. Okay, we all we think that you need a lot of attention to uh, raise uh, one or two young children, but we have to remember that there's high and higher divorce rate. For all sorts of reasons, for divorced family, the attention the children enjoy very, very often is compromised because they, one parent is not around all the time. So actually, divorce rate rise up significantly in the past 10 years. And also, we have a lot of migrant children. Um, come to Hong Kong with a one-way permit. And many of them are young children. So are these children, do they need more attention compared to a local children born in Hong Kong? Um, we talk about childcare, is it just to look after them so no accident happen? Or we really want a generation who are better than ours? and we give them the best, the, a good development. Okay, ethnic minorities, they're on the rise. Um, so, there's uh, getting more and more minority children under the age of nine. So, their parents, many of them don't speak Chinese. So, they're quite isolated. So, do they need the same as um, Hong Kong children, Hong Kong-born children? or they need extra. For example, someone to support the family to be more integrated in Hong Kong, someone to tell them more about social services, 
even for public services. Can they enjoy parks as we do? Go to a library? Go to swim in public pool? I doubt it. And HHPC is running a lot of service for every minority children and families, and we found that they're so segregated. Many of these families don't understand Hong Kong that much. They really live in a small community, and, and they don't know quite Hong Kong, don't know a lot about Hong Kong. What about children with diagnosed developmental disabilities? We don't know how many of them is a question mark if they have the right stimulation at earlier age they would not fall into the group of developmental delay. Because in Hong Kong, it's good that we offer early intervention. As long as they, they fall into a certain delay uh, in, in, the, in milestone, we will offer service to them. But my question is, can we do things earlier? What about if every child got the right stimulation? Would the number go down a little bit? Another question is home care versus maternal care. Government always say that, well, a lot of children are cared at their own home. Yes, right. The one receiving childcare service, even I can't informal and formal care together, it's not a big percentage. Why? As uh, Professor Chiu said that, many of them were cared by foreign domestic helpers. But are there the equal parents as the own biological parents. Uh, we can see that it's on the rise. We can see that household with more zero to five, they employ more domestic helpers. Part of the reason is clear. And that number falls with the age of the child older. You can see that a smaller percentage when the child go to 6 to 14, and then a smaller percentage when the child reach 15. So, we, we also want to know who are our child's primary caretakers. And you can see that those take care by the mother in the daytime is about 37%. And you, almost the same percentage is by domestic helper. So as I shared earlier, so what kind of stimulation they get in the daytime, a long day, just TV or I don't know. About nighttime, you can see that more mother will take care of the child themselves, but still 11%, they're still taken care by the domestic helper. I have some concern, it means almost 24 hours. Then what kind of stimulation they are receiving? So when we look about childcare and family support, I want to see one angle is quality matters. So there's a, 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 a longitudinal research by uh, NICD-CHD in USA. They try to study different modes of childcare. They divide by two big groups. One is maternal care. The mother takes care of the baby herself. The other group is non-maternal care, including father's care. <laughs> grandparents' care. So all informal and formal care. So when they studied two groups, and they found that it's interesting that children in quality non-maternal care show better language and cognitive development at age four and a half years old. So quality counts. It's very important. Not just someone to look after the child, but who are they, those someone? What kind of stimulation they're giving? So they try to measure quality. Quality in two aspects. One is structural features. It's easy. Child, adult child ratio, you know, every country try to compare that. It's easy. I think Hong Kong is not advanced. Um, group size is easy. Caregivers education level. So for informal child care, who are the caregivers? Becomes a very important question because educational level counts. The second is the process research, a uh, process features. That's even more important. Is, is the caregiver showing a positive attitude towards the child? Is the child being welcomed? Or is, 
a hassle to me, you know, you cry again. I, I'm so impatient. Is the caregiver giving positive physical contact? Responding to the child's vocalizations? Try to encourage him or her to talk, to sing? Asking questions? So invite the child to provide the answer? And also talking in different ways, praising the child, teaching the child, telling stories, singing. All those are important. Do they encourage development? So give a child a little bit of challenge so the child will reach the next level. Advancing behavior, doing better things, reading to the child, and also eliminating negative interactions. All caregivers have some days have bad moods, right? Even professional childcare workers. But for, for professional childcare workers, they have someone to supervise them, right? The supervisor would, hey, my child, man now, right? But for informal childcare, do the child care giver have that kind of awareness? And also they found that parent and family's characteristics have a very strong link to the child outcome. So is childcare just about taking care of the child or should we extend to parent education? Because family feature is very important. And also we found that positive home environment, they were emotionally supportive, cognitively enriched, and also when mothers experience less psychological stress, children are doing much better. So I don't repeat the problem in Hong Kong. <laughs> it's inadequate places. Many districts don't have the provision. And the government has no standard at all. Since mid-90s, they cancelled the standard. So now it's like a random, you know, just irregularly they add one or two childcare centers. We are left behind much compared to others because our statistic is about 13%, 0 to 3. You see other countries are over 30%. Not affordable. Uh, just share one thing. Everybody is happy, looking forward to the free kindergarten education, right? That's going to launch next year. The good news is kindergarten teacher would have higher salary, so all the teaching staff would enjoy a better remuneration package. But since childcare workers and teachers, they have the same entry requirement in their profession, so would someone work in a childcare center if you don't raise their salary? Then it means a much higher cost for our parents. At present, the cost is around 6000 5000 already. So what's the future cost? 7000 8000 9000 Can our parents afford that? Mind you, the median income is 28000 a month for the family. So present, we have a subsidy scheme for, a subsidy scheme for the parents. But unluckily, if you are qualified for free childcare services, you have to be below the poverty line your salary will be lower than the poverty line. It's too low. So parents who are just slightly above the poverty line have to pay one-fourth of the fee, and it's too high for them. And also many of them are not eligible. OK, just a little bit about what parents feel. We, have, we did a survey, and parents shared with us that the current number of children are not up to their ideal. They want more children. They want more children. So what would help them? Appro having appropriate child carer, 90%. Or having appropriate daytime child care services. So completely agree with Dr. Chiu's <laughs> literature and research review. And they found that two best choices for them is grandparent care and day crash. What would affect the choice of daycare? They need quality, of course, safe environment, and also uh, accessible, not too far away. So if you, your district don't have one, the government fail, right? Uh, affordability. Tr they prefer trained professional worker. I think there's a quality assurance there. Flexible service hours. Program that encourage and support child development. 
and give parenting support. And they also think that uh, family-friendly measures is also important. Uh, so I don't repeat that. So what's the implica implication for us? I think as many speakers uh, talk today, raising a child is not just a private matter. It should be a shared responsibility. The government should think about providing high-quality, affordable, and accessible childcare to parents. We need concrete planning. The waiting is so long. Just calculating on the waiting list, concrete evidence, we think that we need much more. We need at least 100 places per 2,500 children. So parents don't worry and have high stress. We think we really have to adjust the portion the parent have to shoulder. I think 50-50 is a good rule. We want to increase subsidy for the childcare centers. I think the rest of the center has a good point is we are sure that the money goes to the children because it pays the salary and you have someone to monitor the service. And parents think that about 3000 something a month is reasonable for them. I think universal, free and accessible parent education and parent child activities is very needed with a very uh, complex family background now. Many families really need more support and also we really totally support family-friendly employment policies. Thank you.